Okay. Uh, yeah. Greetings. Uh, I welcome you all to the fourth session of the webinar series on management of children with COVID-19. Uh, this webinar series has been uh, prepared by experts from across the country and the effort has been coordinated by the Department of Pediatrics at Ames, New Delhi. Uh, the initiative has been supported and funded by the WHO CRO office. In today's session, we're going to be covering three main areas. One is about the environmental sanitation, biomedical waste management, dead body disposal in the setting of COVID, infection prevention and control uh, for the healthcare settings, uh, particularly about protection of the healthcare personnel, and about uh, transmission of information related to COVID to the local uh, authorities. Uh, these uh, and we will also be covering or showing you a video on the donning and doffing, which is critical when we look at uh, working in the COVID care areas. Uh, so, with this brief background, I would now uh, we have with us today Dr. Ashok Diorari, professor and head of the Department of Pediatrics at Ames, New Delhi, uh, to say a few words about uh, the the program and as well as guide us further. Dr. Diorari, sir. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Dr. Rakesh Loda and Kushil Tabra on, on behalf of the Department of Pediatrics, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. We are fortunate that we are able to share the learnings related to COVID management with all of, with all of you, with all our uh, CRO country uh, uh, members and the professionals who are logged on for this uh, webinar. I would put on record the support we have got from our director for, uh, for ensuring we are able to collect evidence-based guidelines for management of COVID in children and overall provide high quality care for patients who are getting admitted in the hospital. So this is the fourth webinar in the series, and it is so important that all of us need to know how healthcare professionals need to be protected themselves while they are taking care of the patients and the families who are admitted under them in the COVID wards and the ICU, especially the children and the families. In addition, it is very important that we need to have a standard operating procedure for biomedical waste uh, generated in the hospital, in the COVID wards. And also we have to ensure that our healthcare professionals, especially the nurses, the hospital attendants, and the doctors who are taking care of the patient know the proper donning, doffing techniques, and also how do they take care of the patients while they are taking care of them in the ICUs. The place where there is a lot of aerosol generation, which uh, may affect the healthcare professionals. So in this uh, webinar today, I am so happy that we have uh, uh, our experts uh, who are going to join from microbiology department, Dr. Arti Kapil. She is a professor in microbiology. She is heading the task force from the microbiology uh, department for making sure that all healthcare professionals adhere to the SOPs for taking care of themselves for uh, uh, while they are providing care for COVID patient. I know in the previous uh, webinars, it is also covered that how home isolation practices have to be followed. And at this time, while we have, are seeing a surge of COVID cases in many of the cities, especially in India, and maybe in some other countries in the region, we have to follow COVID appropriate behavior in terms of uh, all the time wearing masks while we are in the public space. We have to avoid that there are not many people getting collected. Physical distancing has to be maintained and then hand hygiene has to be followed uh, judiciously. So if we take care of all these things, we'll also pre prevent transmission in the community and we'll have less number of patients who are going to get to our COVID hospitals, especially who get sick while they are in home isolation. So I must uh, put on record the hard work 
which has been led by Professor Sushil Kabra, uh, who took this initiative on behalf of uh, WHO CRO with able support from uh, Dr. Nina Rena and Rajesh Mehta from WHO CRO office that they had together envisioned that we will uh, take this to more and more people in the region so that the learnings can be spread quickly. I am very sure Sushil and Rakesh Loda and their team will come back because this series is not finished at this point because the new evidence is going to come. Maybe new vaccine is going to come after some time. So they will come back to you maybe after two weeks or three weeks with another seminar, a webinar, which will supplement on whatever learning has been done in these four webinars. With these words, I hand over back to Rakesh Loda to proceed with the session. Over to you, Rakesh. And uh, it's uh, the important aspects that you have highlighted about COVID appropriate behavior and our need to continuously adhere to the preventive strategies, even in the community setting are critical to make sure that the cases don't increase further. And uh, I would now hand over to Dr. Cabra and who's also going to elaborate upon some of the things that you said that, you know, we need to continue with the series and uh, bring in the new developments, share new evidence. Uh, Dr. Cabra. Okay, good afternoon, friends. Uh, the series of 16 webinars, 13 were already webcast in last three weeks time. And uh, these included on 15th of uh, October, it included overview, transmission, clinical features and diagnosis of uh, uh, COVID. Second session was on 22nd and that included how to assess severity, decide about admission and management of various severity along with that details of how to handle newborns in this season. The third one was on the 29th, same time and it included management in pediatric intensive care, special uh, features for what precautions to be observed during uh, resuscitation and we elaborated upon newly emerging disease and that is MISC and uh, all these webinars are available and uh, then we also discussed about what to do after the discharge, how to take care of uh, post discharge care of these patients at home. Then uh, all these webinars are available on channel of uh, AIMS telemedicine YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. You can have access to these without any restriction. And as today we are having a three webinars and at end of each webinar, there will be some MCQ for self-assessment. So just see those and the answers will be given at end of each webinar. And uh, please write your comments, your questions, any clarifications in the YouTube chat box or uh, we have displayed a WhatsApp number. You can also WhatsApp us. So now we are going to have a first uh, uh, session of today, first webinar of today, and that is environmental sanitation, management of biomedical waste disposal and handling dead bodies. So first uh, uh, webinar please by Professor Arti Kapil. Now we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about environmental, environmental disinfection, disinfection, biomedical, biomedical waste, waste management, management and, and dead, dead body, body disposal, disposal in context of COVID-19. As, As this present COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic continues to pose a challenge, challenge there, is there is a need, a need to, undertake to undertake all possible interventions of infection prevention and control diligently, especially as long as we do not have a specific treatment available. Environmental disinfection is one such important measure. Biomedical waste management also constitute an aspect of environmental safety so that all infectious waste can be disposed and treated safely to prevent transmission to other persons as well as keeping environmental pollution into consideration. To complete the subject, we also will talk of dead body disposal and disinfection as it is different for COVID-19 patients. Now, what, so what is the, is the role, role of, of environment? As the person suffering from disease coughs or sneezes or talks loudly, aerosols of different sizes are generated and 
subsequently settle down in the surrounding surfaces depending upon the size of the aerosol. In many earlier studies on respiratory infections models, a cutoff of 5 micron size of droplets has been shown to be a factor determining whether the infectious transmission will be contact based or airborne based which has implication in deciding the control measures. So, as it is evident when the aerosols of the size more than 5 micron are generated the respiratory droplets fall on surfaces around. In such situations the environmental disinfection becomes important and intervention in prevention and control of transmission will be done accordingly. So, coming to the environmental contamination. So, after these aerosols let us assume have settled in the surrounding surface areas, the virus can remain on the surfaces for a certain length of time depending upon the various factors like the nature of the surfaces and other conditions temperature, humidity as has been observed with other respiratory viruses. So, transmission can then occur via contact with the hands. When a person touches these contaminated surfaces especially the high touch surfaces and then touches the face or eyes then transmission of this infection can occur. Therefore, use of an effective disinfectant at frequent intervals is needed to prevent such occurrences. Important point to remember here is that due, uh, that cleaning with detergent is essential before disinfection takes place because organic matter reduces the efficiency of a disinfectant. Another important aspect regarding the optimal action of a disinfection is the concentration and the contact time of a disinfectant. Now, let me take you through the steps of disinfection because these are something which we normally do not read about or study, but I think now it has become important that all of us understands what steps should be taken. So, first is while the patient is admitted. That time you can cordon off the contaminated area because there are other patients also in the ward, wear appropriate PPE, mop the floor with detergent, water and then proceed to disinfection using 1 percent sodium hypochlorite on the floors and all surfaces. We must remember that freshly prepared hypochlorite should be used each time and a contact time of at least 10 minutes should be there after its application. Alternatively 70 percent alcohol can be used for delicate instruments or metallic surfaces. After applying the disinfectant mop the surface with damp cloth and avoid spraying the disinfectant or leaving the disinfectant on the surface. Next we move to the steps of dis disinfection when the patient gets discharged. So, now after shifting the positive patient either to a dedicated facility or when the patient gets discharged from the isolation room then terminal disinfection can be done. So, for which we do first two step cleaning with the detergent and 1 percent sodium hypochlorite and this can be followed with fogging using hydrogen peroxide because it will reach to all the crevices and corners of the room and this can be done as per the institutional policy. So, now let us move to the recommended frequency of disinfection which is based upon the WHO guidelines, but institutes can make their own policy. But generally speaking the screening and triage areas should be disinfected at least twice daily, in patient rooms again twice daily, but preferably three times a day especially the high touch surfaces. Then in patient rooms also if unoccupied then terminal cleaning should be done after discharge as I have already told you earlier. The outpatients and the ambulatory care rooms after each patient visit ideally, but again you have to see according to your own workload, 
hallways and corridors at least twice a daily. Then patients' bathrooms, toilets, private patient room toilets at least twice a daily. But if they are shared toilets, then at least three times a day. Now, let us come to a very important part which is the implementation and monitoring of disinfection because that is very important for any um, administrative or infection control program. So, monitoring is most important, SOPs must be defined, work instructions should be displayed in bold. There should be a clear delineation of responsibilities. One should know who will look after what aspect of cleaning. Senior supervisory staff should check how the persons are preparing the uh, solutions. Measuring devices must be provided so that they prepare the accurate, adequate amount of the disinfectant and this is very important. Then you can have checklists to ensure the frequency and that should also be uh, signed out by all the senior staff members. Especially the toilet areas need attention, supply of hand rubs, soap solutions should be ensured in adequate amounts. We have observed in our day to day practice that many a times the fear of pilferage or somebody will take it away that can sometimes keep all these the, the staff tends to keep them in cupboards and shelves they should be adequately available and should be uh, encouraged everybody should be encouraged to use them training of staff is very important how to don appropriate PPE during disinfection how to do hand hygiene and how to uh, on the other practices of the infection control standard precautions. From so this takes care of our disinfection protocols. Let us now move on to the biomedical waste management. Now biomedical waste management in context of COVID-19 is a little different and that is why as I told earlier also that is why we are discussing it here today. The, uh, we know it is a league under the legal framework under the constitution of India article 21 which includes the fundamental right to clean environment with health and medical care. Biomedical waste management and handling rules were formed and were implemented in 1998. The biomedical waste management rules in 2016 were further revised and they basically apply to all persons who generate, collect, receive, store, transport, treat, dispose or handle the medical waste. For example, hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, dispensaries, path laboratories, blood banks, health camps the forensic laboratories, research laboratories, etc. Now, subsequently uh, this uh, rules now is under the Central Pollution Control Board under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Now, what are the key points of any biomedical waste management rules? There should be a proper segregation of the waste that is the core principle of the biomedical waste. Collection and transportation is vital link between the prevention and treatment of waste and the common biomedical waste treatment facilities are authorized which are known as the common in short CBWTF. Now, it is very important that the staff should be trained in infection control in these people who are treating or handling the biomedical waste. The, this slide will show you a picture of what are the color coded segregation to be done at the point of generation and this we are all aware that there is a red bag, there is a yellow bag, there is a blue container, there is a puncture proof white container and a black bag. Next we move on to the treatment of this waste based upon the color coding. So, the yellow bin or the yellow bag is to be 
incinerated. The red bags can go to autoclaves, microwaves and then subsequently shredding and recycling can be done. The blue bags or containers again go for shredding and recycling and the white container goes to autoclaving, shredding or recycling. Important thing is that liquid waste is to be managed through a effluent treatment plant or a sewer treatment plant. Microbiology laboratory waste and the blood bags should be pre-treated on site in the hospital before giving to the common waste management facility. Let us now move to the waste management in context of COVID-19. As the epidemic spreads, the number of hospital beds may not be able to meet the requirement of the patients falling sick. So, only moderate to severe cases would need hospitalization, but a large number of uh, persons who have mild cases or mild to moderate uh, and otherwise no risk factors can be hospitalized in COVID care facilities or home isolation. So, that is why there is a need that many areas would be generating waste which do not otherwise conventionally come under the legal ambit of the biomedical waste generating facilities. So, with that need there was a need for revision and development of a mechanism to dispose of food, PPE etc. from such areas which were otherwise not the organization having licenses for biomedical waste generation and disposal. In context of COVID-19, the following areas will need attention. One of course is the COVID-19 isolation wards. There are sample collection centers which will be in the field, laboratories in the field, quarantine camps, home care facilities, then common waste management treatment facilities, the urban local bodies and management of waste water from the health care facilities or the isolation facilities. So, these are some of the aspects which have been introduced into the system of waste management in context of COVID. So, as I have already said, this revision of guidelines in context of COVID-19, they address to how hospitals should manage COVID-19 waste, how this waste should be segregated and handled, how to dispose of PPE, how to take care of quarantine and home care facilities, manage in the households the general waste which is generated when the patient is isolated in home care. Then sample collection units in the community, then common waste management treatment facilities or urban local bodies, ETP, STP monitoring, these are all the aspects that have been discussed in the revision. They recommend that disinfection of all bags and trolleys must be done from outside and to minimize the yellow bag waste and medications all the waste should be treated as solid waste management from the households. Now, just to give you an idea on some of the COVID-19 waste specific treatments, the, in the hospitals double layered bags should be used because it is thought that single strength may not be providing adequate strength. There is dedicated collection bins labeled as COVID-19 then these bags and trolleys etc. should be disinfected from outside and they should all be monitored or audited. Then moving on to the transport to the common biomedical treatment facilities, it is important to have a proper record, ensure proper disinfection of trolleys and bags, adequate PPE should be provided to the staff. The treatment and disposal should be done immediately after receiving, so there should be no delay. So, with that we come to the important aspects of the waste management facilities and move on quickly to the management of the COVID-19 dead bodies. 
So there are three important things, the packaging, disinfection and disposal. Now let us look at the packaging of the dead body. Every case needs to be treated as COVID-19 in the present context and I am showing you a poster which shows the steps of packaging. Generally, no direct contact with blood or body fluids should be allowed with the dead body. The person packing should put on the PPE which includes heavy duty gloves, water resistant gowns or a plastic apron, N95 mask, goggles or face shield. All the tubes, drains and catheters on the dead body should be removed. All wounds, cuts and abrasions should be disinfected with 1 percent sodium hypochlorite and covered with a waterproof bandage. All orifices need to be plugged and then you tie and put the hands folded onto the abdomen, chest and legs at ankles are to be tied with a cotton bandage. Then you have to place one unzipped body bag on a trolley onto which then you put a white shroud or white sheet which can be spread on the stretcher. Then put on a polythene sheet, a thick polythene sheet over the uh, white sheet and then one is ready to transfer the body onto this stretcher. After you have put this body on the stretcher, wrapping of the polythene sheet over the body is done by raising both the sides up bringing them at the center and holding downwards. Basically the idea is to completely wrap from all around from the legs, from the head and from the sides. After that similarly the white linen sheet is also wrapped all over the body so as to wrap it around the head, the legs and the sides. Then one is ready to zip the body bag, then this should be disinfected from outside, put a label of the name, age, sex, the UHID and all the other relevant details for identification and then it is ready to be disposed of. Following the disposal of the body, one has to do the environmental cleaning also. All the disposal of the waste that has been generated in the process of this wrapping should be disposed as per the guidelines. Used linen should be handled as little as possible. The laundry bag should be securely tied. The staff should follow their hospital guidelines in the handling of soil linen. Then the, all the used equipment should be autoclaved or decontaminated with a disinfectant as per the hospital policy. All surfaces which might have got contaminated then should be wiped with 1 percent sodium hypochlorite, leave it for about 15 to 20 minutes and metal surfaces should be wiped with 70 percent alcohol as I have told you earlier in disinfection. Regarding the disposal of the dead body, viewing should be avoided, but in a funeral parlor with all precautions it can be allowed. Embalming is not allowed and finally cremation is advisable. Next slide shows you some of the references that I have used in preparing this presentation as mostly these are international and national guidelines. And so with that we come to an end. Thank you.
ठीक चलो जी okay so after uh, this uh, session on the environmental sanitation now we move to infection prevention and control practices in a healthcare uh, setting this would be followed by a video on donning and doffing second greetings continuing with the series of webinars on pediatric covid infection today we're going to discuss about prevention of infections in a healthcare settings including protection of healthcare workers i am dr rakesh tota professor of pediatrics at all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and today i will be discussing the presentation under the following headings how infections spread infection prevention and control measures that is ipc measures which include standard precautions and expanded precautions and the recommended ipc practices for covid-19 for any infection to occur there are three important conditions source this is the place where the infectious agents thrive or live and source could be people who can be patients healthcare workers or visitors particularly in the setting of covid the person could be symptomatic or asymptomatic at the same time the source can also be environment around an individual which could be inanimate environment it could be air stethoscopes linen etc then we need a susceptible person for a per infection to occur germs must enter a susceptible person's body invade the tissues multiply cause damage leading to disease and susceptible person can be healthy who is not vaccinated or not immune because of any prior exposure in the past the person with a weakened immune system such as a patient with hiv or someone on immunosuppressants and for certain infections additional routes of entry of germs can also increase susceptibility for an infection like surgery that is surgical site infections urinary tract infections uh, with urinary catheters the transmission has to be occur through certain routes it can occur by contact spray splashes which occur when droplets from coughing sneezing or talking within 6 feet land on a mucosal surface it could also occur by inhalation when the germs are aerosolized in tiny particles this aerosol generation can occur while coughing sneezing or talking or while performing aerosol generating procedures such as nebulization which we'll be discussing later sharp injuries with contaminated needles and sharp instruments like can transmit infections like hiv hepatitis b etc now moving on the infection prevention and control measures include standard precautions and various contact based precautions standard precautions should be followed while taking care of all patients and include the following hand hygiene use of personal protection equipment whenever expecting a possible exposure to infectious material following respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette principles ensure appropriate patient placement properly handle and properly clean and disinfect patient care equipment and instruments or devices clean and disinfect environment properly follow safe injection practices ensure healthcare worker safety including proper handling of needles and other shops handle textiles and laundry carefully with minimum agitation now while transmission based precautions include precautions to be taken based on patient illness and procedures uh these could vary uh, uh, from contact precautions droplet precautions and airborne precautions hand hygiene is an important measure for containing covid-19 infection and this includes hand wash and hand rub hand wash can be done with a non antimicrobial or antimicrobial soap and should be done when the hands are visibly dirty contaminated with proteinaceous material visibly soiled with blood or body fluids for hand rub or alcohol based hand rub should be used as per the cdc recommendation hand rub containing at least 60% of ethanol or 70% of isopropanol inactivates the sars cov2 virus and should be used hand rub is the preferred mode of uh, hand hygiene and should be performed if the hands are not visibly soiled one should avoid unnecessary touching of surfaces in close proximity of the patient now This picture shows us the steps to perform hand hygiene as per the WHO guidelines. The WHO recommends hand rub to be done for 20 to 30 seconds and a hand wash for 40 to 60 seconds. Uh, however, the CDC guidelines recommends at least 20 seconds of bo for both hand wash and hand rub. 
one should take a sufficient amount of alcohol based hand rub and then perform the following steps as depicted in this pictures. The steps are similar for hand wash and aim that all sides of both hands are decontaminated. When do we need to perform hand hygiene? Now, WHO's five movements of hand hygiene shows us the key moments when a healthcare worker should perform hand hygiene, which are one to five. It should also be performed if hands will be moving from a contaminated body site to a clean body site during patient care, before putting on PPEs and after removing the gloves or PPE. One should wash hands with a non-antimicrobial and antimicrobial soap and water if there is contact with spores because alcohols, chlorhexidine, iodophores and other antiseptic agents have poor activity against spores before eating and after using the restroom. Now, this figure shows us the routes by which the respiratory pathogen can spread. So, when an infected person coughs or sneezes or even talks, droplets form which carry germs to short distances, typically within 6 feet distance. These droplets can land on susceptible person's mucosa that is eyes, nose or mouth and cause infection. While the smaller droplets or aerosol less than 5 micrometer can be inhaled by a person near an infected source that is spread by short range airborne route or these could be carried away by air currents to long distances that is beyond 6 feet and could spread infection. The other route through which the virus can spread is through fomites which form after droplets and aerosol uh, settle on the surface. So, when a person touches this object or surface contaminated by virus infected person and then touches his own eyes, nose or mouth, he, she may get exposed to the virus. According to the current evidence, the COVID-19 virus is primarily transmitted between people through respiratory droplets and contact route. Earlier, it was said that airborne transmissions of SARS-CoV-2 occurs during aerosol generating procedures such as coughing, talking, but now the evidence suggests that this virus may spread even in absence of aerosol generating procedures, particularly in indoor settings with poor ventilation. Transmission through droplets can be prevented by taking droplet precautions, through airborne route by airborne precautions. And to prevent transmission by fomites, one should take contact precautions and perform hand hygiene and avoid touching eye, nose, mouth and face. Now, moving on to the use of personal protective equipment. Personal pro protective equipment act as a barrier to prevent entry of the virus into the body and include the following. Gloves, these should be used when touching blood, body fluids, secretions, excretions, contaminated items mucous membranes or non-intact skin. So, basically before touching any potentially infectious material. Gowns and coveralls when contact of clothing or exposed skin is ex anticipated. The PPE for contact precautions protects from fomites and includes gown or coverall and gloves. PPE for droplet precautions protects mucosa, the eye, nose and the mouth from droplets and includes surgical masks and goggles or face shield. Surgical mask covers nose and mouth while goggles and face shield provide eye protection. PPE for airborne infection precautions filters air to be inspired and includes particulate respirators. So, now we know that SARS-CoV-2 can spread through droplets, fomites and aerosols. The following PPE are recommended when taking care of COVID-19 patients. So, we need to use uh, approved N95 or equivalent or a higher level respirator. Face mask can be used if a respirator is not available, but while performing aerosol generating procedures such as nebulization, respirator is a must. Gowns or coveralls with or without apron have to be used. If you look at a gown, it does not cover the head, neck and lower legs, while the coveralls are designed to cover the whole body and sometimes even the feet. Most people would use two pairs of gloves. For eye protection, one needs to use goggles and uh, or a face shield. Personal eye glasses or contact lenses are not considered adequate for eye protection. Head cover and shoe cover should be donned if you are using a gown. Patients with confirmed or possible SARS-CoV-2 infection should wear a face mask or N95 respirator to contain spread of uh, infection. Now, coming to the specific types of PPE for respiratory protection. For this, we have respirators which filter air before it is inhaled, thereby providing respiratory protection. They protect against hazardous airborne particles including dust particles and infectious agents, gases or vapors. 
These differ from face masks as face masks protect from droplets and not from aerosol. Broadly, there are three types of respirators, uh, filtering face piece uh, respirators that is FFPs, half or full face elastomeric respirators and powered air purifying respirators which are called as PAPRs. Now looking at each of these, we will start with the filtering face piece respirators which includes the N95 respirators or equivalent. These are disposable half face piece respirators which filter out particles. Filter uh, series available are N which are not resistant to oil or somewhat uh, oil resistant and P oil proof and the number indicates the filter efficiency. So various FFRs available are N95, N99, N100, R95, P95, P99, P100 and we have equivalent series like FFP2 or FFP3. Now most commonly used is the N95 respirator which means that it is not resistant to oil and 95 means that it filters out at least 95 percent of the airborne particles. FFRs are approved by the CDC's uh, NIOSH. At the same time, there are other certifying agencies in various uh, uh, countries and like European Union for India, it is a FFP series. So for us, it would be FFP2 and FFP3. Now these must be worn throughout the period of exposure. The picture shows FFR without uh, exhalation and with exhalation valve. Without exhalation valve, the respirator does not filter the expired air and hence should not be used for source control. Now, when we are using the respirators, one must perform a user seal check and should be performed each time a respirator is done to ensure a proper fit. It can be done with positive or a negative pressure check. To perform a positive pressure check, uh, it needs to be, we need to see the picture. We need to also remember that positive pressure check can't be done in a, uh, a respirator with an exhalation valve. Now, as shown in this picture, one should place hands over the face piece and then gently exhale into the face piece. It is considered satisfactory if slight positive pressure is built up inside without any outward leakage of air at the seal. Leak is present if any of the following is present. Feeling of air movement on the face along the seal of the face piece, fogging of glasses and no pressure built up inside the respirator. To perform a negative pressure check, as shown in the picture, one would place hands over the face piece and inhale gently. It is considered satisfactory if the face piece collapses on the face and you do not feel any air passing between face and the face piece. Either of positive pressure or negative pressure check can be done. If it is unsatisfactory, one would readjust the nose piece and repeat. Now the other respirators include elastomeric half piece respirators. These are reusable face piece uh, respirators while the uh, FFR that we talked about were disposable single use respirators. They contain replaceable cartridges of filters which protect against particles, gases or vapors depending on the type of filter. These covers the nose and the mouth. The elastomeric full face piece respirators are similar except that they provide a more effective face seal and provide eye protection in addition. Now coming to the powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs. These are also reusable. They contain replaceable filters or cartridges and protect against particles, gases and vapors depending on type of the filter. In addition, they also provide eye protection. These are battery powered with a blower that pulls air through an attached filter and pumps in purified air into the headpiece. The breathing resistance with these devices is low and at the same time an additional advantage is that there is no uh, fogging when these devices are used. Now, how to don the PPEs? So first we need to identify and gather the proper PPE to don. We need to have appropriate gown size, appropriate set of gloves, appropriate mask. We need to perform hand hygiene using a hand sanitizer or a hand rub. Thereafter we put on the gown or coverall, the respirator which could be a N95 or an equivalent respirator, put on the goggles or the face shield and it should not interfere with the fit of the respirator when we put on a face shield. The flexible frame of goggles should provide a good seal with the skin of the face covering the eyes and the surrounding areas and even accommodating for the prescription glasses. Fogging may be common when goggles are used so one needs to make sure that the respirator is well fitting. Two pairs of gloves are used, one pair is torn to begin with and thereafter another pair would be torn. Combination of PPE will affect the sequence 
and therefore be practical and we would refer you to watch the videos that has also been uploaded. Now, steps of doffing are equally important and these should be done slowly and deliberately in a sequence that prevents self-contamination as this could be one major source of infection for healthcare workers looking after COVID-19 patients. Always take assistance while doffing, there should be a buddy or there would be somebody who would be supervising the doffing and it is important to perform hand hygiene after every step. First, inspect the gown or coverall for gross contamination and if it is there, clean with alcohol swab. Remove the first pair of gloves, using the gloved hand, the grasp the outside edge near the wrist or over the palm and peel away from hand, turning the glove inside out. Thereafter, hold in the opposite gloved hand, slide the ungloved uh, finger under the wrist of the remaining glove and peel off from inside creating a bag for both the gloves and then discard in the appropriate bin. For removing face shield or goggles, you need to carefully remove the face shield or goggles by grabbing the strap and pulling upwards and away from the head. Do not touch the front of the face shield or the goggles. The coverall and gowns, the outside and the sleeves are likely to be contaminated. One should unfasten the ties, should peel away from the neck and shoulder and turn the contaminated outside surface towards the inside and fold and roll into a bundle and then discard. For removing the respirator, lift the bottom elastic over your head first and lift off the top elastic strap and thereafter discard. Do not touch the front of the respirator or the face mask. If we are using a face mask, carefully untie or unhook from the ears and pull away from the face without touching the front and make sure that you perform hand hygiene after every step of doffing and finally need to clean up hands again. A few words about the respiratory hygiene or cuff etiquettes. We need to place visual alerts to at entrance to outpatient facilities exam to make sure that anybody who has symptoms of respiratory hygiene and cuff etiquette has to be followed. Respiratory hygiene and cuff etiquette is recommended for all individuals with signs and symptoms of respiratory infection. One should cover the mouth and nose with a tissue when coughing or sneezing and dispose of the tissue after use. One should perform hand hygiene after contact with respiratory secretions and contaminated objects. Ensure availability of tissues, no touch receptacles like a foot pedal operated one for disposing used tissue and there should be alcohol based hand rub in the waiting area. Masking and separation of persons with respiratory symptoms should be done during periods of increased respiratory infection activity in the community as has been done currently for COVID-19. Moving on now to the droplet precautions, we need to take these uh, precautions as well. It is important to uh, ensure patient placement for COVID-19. One should evaluate the need for hospitalization. Home care is preferable if individual situation allows particularly for mild infections and asymptomatic people. If infected in, uh, if admitted a single person room with attached bathroom with the door closed is advisable. Uh, airborne infection isolation rooms are reserved for patients who undergo aerosol generating procedures like nebulizations or those who may need intubation and ventilation. These should be designated healthcare workers to take care of uh, uh, only these patients. One should limit the transport and movement of patients outside the room and one should communicate before transfer of a individual. One should perform procedures and tests bedside wherever possible. One should use portable x-ray machines rather than shifting patients for these tests. If the patient has been transported, he or she should wear a face mask during the transport. Now, let us talk a little bit about the airborne infection isolation rooms. Now, these are single patient rooms at negative pressure relative to the surrounding areas and with a minimum 6 air changes per hour. It is preferable to have up to 12 air changes per hour, but this may be possible only for newly constructed ones or with renovation. It would be desirable to install multiple exhaust fans if uh, uh, isolation room facility is not available and this prevents the airborne diseases or uh, the aerosols from escaping from the room and contaminating the environment to infect other people. Air from these rooms should be exhausted directly to outside or filtered through a high efficiency particulate air filter that is the HEPA filter. The room door should be kept closed except when entering or leaving the room to maintain the negative pressure in these rooms. 
one should monitor proper negative pressure function in these rooms. Now, another big area to look at is the patient care equipment and devices. As these may be contaminated with the body fluids, fomites or blood and the policies and procedures for containing, transporting and handling equipment should be established. One should remove the organic material using uh, recommended cleaning agents before high level disinfection or sterilization is done. This will enable effective disinfection and sterilization process. One should wear PP according to the level of anticipated contamination when handling such a situation. It is equally important to take care of the environment. We should have routine and targeted cleaning of environmental surfaces as indicated by the level of patient contact and degree of soiling. Clean and disinfect surfaces that are likely to be contaminated with pathogens. The common ones include those which are in close proximity to the patient such as bed rails over the bed tables. Similarly, frequently touched surfaces such as door knobs need to be disinfected more frequently. Appropriately registered certified disinfectants that have microficidal activity against pathogens most likely to contaminate the patient care environment should be used. So, in the setting of COVID, the commonly used agent is a sodium hypochlorite solution in a strength of 1 percent or ordinary bleach. Uh, these effectively kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Dedicated medical equipment for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients should be considered. Now we move on to the safe injection practices and here we need to use aseptic techniques to avoid contamination of sterile injection equipment. We should not administer medications from a syringe to multiple patients. Use fluid infusion and administration set for one patient only. Use single dose vials for parental medications whenever possible. If multiple dose vials have to be used, both the needle and syringe used to access the vial must be sterile and should be discarded after every use. Do not keep multiple dose vials in the immediate patient treatment area and these should be stored in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations and discard if we, the sterility is compromised or is questionable. Do not use bags or bottles of intravenous solutions as a common source of supply for multiple patients. These measures are mainly to avoid cross-contamination and contamination of the environment. Now, let us come to the recommended routine IPC practices during COVID-19 pandemic. These are guidelines recently released by the CDC and the WHO. These practices are applicable to all patients with along with the standard precautions, not just those with suspected or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. These include implementing telehealth and nurse directed triage protocols, whether the patient can be managed at home or in person or ED, this has to be decided. Screening and triaging everyone entering a health facility for signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and this should include a temperature check. One should re-evaluate admitted patients for signs and symptoms of COVID-19 by daily evaluation for COVID-19 symptoms. One should encourage uh, physical distancing, we need to make sure that at least 6 feet distance is there in between the beds in the, in the waiting areas and modifying in person group healthcare activities example by virtual meets or performing such activities in smaller groups. We need to implement universal source control measures and this means covering the patient person's mouth and nose to prevent spread of respiratory secretions when they are talking, sneezing or coughing, using a face mask or a cloth face covering to prevent the spread of infection. Universal means that it is recommended for everyone in a healthcare facility irrespective of symptoms due to the presence of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, individuals who could still spread the infection. Now, respirators with exhalation valves are not recommended for source control as the expired air is not filtered and this could possibly spread the infection. Implementing universal use of personal protective equipment by the healthcare workers. In communities with moderate to substantial community transmission, it is recommended that the healthcare workers also wear eye protection in addition to the, the respirator or the face mask. One would need to use a N95 or a higher level of respirator for aerosol generating procedures. Surgical procedures posing higher risk of transmission for example, ENT surgery. In situations where there is minimal to no community transmission, universal eye protection and respirator recommendations are optional. 
Now consider performing targeted SARS-CoV-2 testing of patients without signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and this may happen before admission, before doing procedures, before diagnostic testing in communities with moderate to sustained SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Consider postponing elective procedures, surgeries and non-urgent outpatient visits. One should create a process to response to SARS-CoV-2 exposure among healthcare workers and others which includes notifying the health department about suspected and confirmed cases, investigation and management of our exposed healthcare personnel, having a dedicated contact tracing team. Now moving on we can look at that the, uh, beyond the general patient care we need to look at the IPC practices when caring for a patient with suspected or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. In addition to general patient care one should establish reporting within and between healthcare facilities and to the public health authorities regarding COVID-19 positive cases. Staff working in hospitals should be aware about patients with suspected or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection and uh, facility plans for response. One should wear full PPE which includes respirator or a face mask, eye protection, gloves, gowns or coveralls. For collection of diagnostic respiratory specimens PPE with respirator should be used. One needs to manage the visitor excess and movement within a facility. Only those essential for patient care should be allowed. Environmental infection control measures should be undertaken like routine cleaning and disinfection procedures and one needs to look at carefully at the aerosol generating procedures. Now let us look at aerosol generating procedures in a bit of detail. Now procedures that generate aerosol include bronchoscopy, suctioning, endotracheal intubation, CPR, nebulization, non-invasive ventilation etc. Now all of these should be performed cautiously and if possible one could avoid them and if we are performing we need to take the following precautions. One should don full PPE, one should use N95 or an equivalent respirator, limit the number of person during procedure, should ideally take place in airborne infection isolation rooms that are negative pressure rooms. In case we have to give a, a, a aerosol medication it would be desirable to use a meter dose inhaler with spacer instead of nebulizing wherever feasible. One may place a medical mask on face if a child is receiving oxygen therapy with nasal prongs or high flow nasal cannula to reduce the aerosol spread. Now when performing intubation and ventilation we need to take the following precautions to limit the aerosol generation. One should avoid bag and mask ventilation and if one has to do it one should use a viral filter or a heat and moisture exchanger filter between the mask and the bag. The most skilled member of the team should perform intubation and a video laryngoscope can help in faster visualization. Rapid sequence intubation should be done, a cuffed endotracheal tube is preferred and if a suction has to be done a closed suction or an inline suction should be done. If not available clamp the ET tube rather than bagging during suction. Neuromuscular blocking agents should be used during intubation or suction if the patient conditions allow that. Now to sum up it is important to follow standard precautions for care of all patients. We need to follow expanded precautions depending on the clinical situation. It is important to triage at entry to the healthcare facility. One needs to don full PPE if caring for a patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Avoid aerosol generating procedures if possible and this particular slide shows some of the references that would be beneficial for you to refer to. I thank you all. बहुत वीडियो है ना वो बता देंगे अच्छा तो चार चार परसेंट
So now we are going to have a small video on the donning and doffing practices and this is based on a coverall based kit. However, as we said in the presentation, a gown based uh, PPE kit could also be used and uh, similar videos are, are available, standard videos from various uh, sites and including uh, there is available at the uh, AIMS website also. So now we'll have a look at the uh, video on donning and doffing. Namaste, we from Ames New Delhi would like to demonstrate the donning and doffing methods in easy steps for the protection of our healthcare workers working in COVID designated areas. Donning or wearing the personal protective equipment must be performed outside the COVID ward in the donning designated area. Healthcare worker must take a meal, go to the washroom and drink water prior to entering the donning area. Remove all accessories like jewelry, watch, wallet, mobile phones, etc. and change into clean hospital scrubs. Wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water. First, perform hand hygiene. Wear the first pair of gloves, which may be sterile or unsterile. Make sure that the cuff of the glove goes as far as possible. Examine the coverall suit for any damage, including tears. Start by wearing the leg sleeves. Then the arm sleeves. and zip up. Cover the zip with the flap attached over the zip. Now sit on a clean chair and wear the shoe covers and pull them up till your calves. Hold the N95 mask like a cup in your hand with both the straps hanging out in the front. Place the mask on your face. Pull and wear the lower strap first, placing it below your ears. Then pull and wear the upper strap, placing it above your ears. The most important step is to check that there should not be more than minimal air leakage around the mask when forcibly exhaling. Now wear the hood covering the forehead and the cheeks. Now wear the face shield over the hood and ensure the fit. Tighten or loosen the face shield with the help of the screw at the back. Now wear the second pair of gloves. Pull them to cover the sleeve cuff 
and forearms as much as possible. You are now ready to enter the covid area. Doffing or taking off the personal protective equipment must be done in the designated doffing area having red biomedical waste bins labeled separately for the each type of PPE. There should be two chairs labeled as clean and dirty, preferably made of plastic or metal which are easy to disinfect. It is very essential to perform each step with utmost care and slowly so as to not generate any aerosol. Perform the hand hygiene after each step. Take the help of the observer to check for any leaks or tear in the person protective equipment. During the entire doffing procedure, the observer must not touch your PPE. Inspect your PPE for any gross contamination. which could be disinfected with the help of alcohol based wipes disinfect your gloves with alcohol based hand rub it should be ideally dispensed from an automated system with the help of your buddy or by pressing the nozzle with your elbow to prevent any contamination Sit on the dirty chair with legs apart. Remove the shoe covers by slowly pulling the outer surface starting from the top and then pull them from the toes end. Try not to cross over your legs while sitting. Discard them in the red bin. Disinfect the outer gloves. Next step is to remove the outer pair of gloves. Be careful so as to not tear or contaminate the inner glove. Pinch the first glove on the outer surface at the wrist and pull it inside out. Hold this glove in the other hand like a ball. Now slide your thumb inside the other glove and remove inside out balling around the previous glove making it into a single bag now disinfect the inner gloves Loosen the face shield by adjusting the screw and remove by holding it from the back handle. Discard in the labeled bin. Now disinfect the inner gloves. First, slide back the hood by holding it from the top. Separate the zip flap and unzip the coverall suit. Holding the suit at the arms, slide it off the shoulder slightly. Then pull the suit from the side of the waist and roll your arms out one By touching the inner surface of the suit, carefully roll out each leg.
and discard it in the designated bin. Disinfect the inner gloves. Now carefully remove the inner pair of gloves as previously described. Perform hand hygiene by using the six steps of hand wash. Now wear a new pair of gloves before removing the mask. Do not touch the exposed surface of the mask. Stoop forward and first remove the lower strap. Then carefully remove the mask by pulling out the upper strap. Disinfect your gloves again. Using alcohol wipes, clean the outer surface of your shoes while sitting on a clean chair. Again disinfect the gloves. Now remove the last pair of gloves. Perform hand hygiene again. Now you're ready to exit the doffing area. Wipe your shoes on a sodium hypochlorite soaked doormat at the exit. So uh, we had a look at the steps in donning and uh, doffing uh, using a coverall base kit. And as I mentioned earlier, similar videos are available if you have to use a gown based uh, kit as well. Uh, you may continue to uh, type in your questions either on a YouTube chat or uh, send us on the WhatsApp number that's been provided uh, in the uh, banner when the presentations uh, come up. Now we move on to the last uh, webinar in this series that's on transmission of information to the local bodies. After this, we'll address a few questions. Dr. Kanaram Jad from AIMS New Delhi. This webinar is about Transmission of information of COVID testing and patients to local bodies. Here we will discuss why there is need for proper transmission of information of COVID-19. We will discuss who all should be notified, how to report the cases of COVID-19, what to do if a COVID patient is detected, how to report a death, and finally, how to use data for disease prevention. Why proper information is required for COVID-19? COVID-19 is a new disease and clinical presentation is variable. Robust data are needed 
from every district and state in a country to measure the public health impact of covid-19 and to plan for timely health interventions to protect communities we should know who are to be notified all suspected probable and confirmed cases of covid-19 should be notified suspected cases of covid-19 are persons with influenza like illness and severe acute respiratory illness who are under investigation for sars cov2 infection probable cases are suspect cases where sars cov2 testing is not available or inconclusive confirmed cases of covid-19 are those who have laboratory confirmed sars cov2 infection each country may have country specific definitions and these should be followed next is to whom to report the cases should be reported to the government as per local rules and regulations of country as per who every country should establish covid-19 care pathways at local regional and national levels in india cases are reported by district and state surveillance units to integrated disease surveillance program the cases need to report on daily basis via online system or other system as established in the country here is an example of case report form from india on left side there is space for demographic details case classifications that is confirmed or suspect and clinical details on right side there is space for travel history laboratory informations clinical details and public health response all the laboratories are supposed to provide daily update that is daily and cumulative about the data of numbers of samples received samples tested samples under testing and positive samples every country should have data tracking system for covid-19 related data here is a screenshot of data tracking system from cdc for usa that is showing total cases total deaths and total cases in last 7 days here is a screenshot of covid-19 data tracking system for india it is also showing total cases total deaths total active cases as cumulative and daily basis if a positive case is detected first of all ship the patient to dedicated covid ward or covid hospital for further management then inform to local response team team in the hospital and start contact tracing each center should constitute rapid response teams and the team should assist state to plan and implement containment strategy and surveillance the team should assist in establishing system for sample transfer to nearest designated laboratory and review implementation of infection prevention and control practices in covid-19 designated health facilities what to do in contact tracing contact tracing should be done by a designated team as decided by local administration as soon as the single event that is identification of suspect or confirmed case is detected contact tracing must be aggressively implemented preferably to be completed within 48 hours contacts of confirmed cases should be traced and monitored for at least 28 days after the last exposure to the case patient for evidence of covid-19 symptoms as per case definition information about contacts can be obtained from patient his or her family members person at patient's workplace or school associates etc a contact is a person that is involved in any of the following providing direct care without proper personal protective equipment for covid-19 patients staying in the same close environment of a covid-19 patient including workplace classroom household and gatherings or traveling together in close proximity that is within 1 meter with a symptomatic person who later tested positive for covid-19 if symptoms of covid-19 appear within first 28 days following the contact the individual should be considered a probable case and reported through reporting system 
Harris contact is who who touch the body fluids of patient that include respiratory secretions, blood, vomit, saliva, urine, or feces, or who had direct physical contact with body of the patient, including physical examination without PP, or who touched or cleaned the linens, clothes, or dishes of patient who lives in the same household as the patient, or anyone in the close proximity within one meter of confirmed case without precautions, or passengers in close proximity that is within one meter of a conveyance with a symptomatic person who later tested positive for COVID-19 for more than six hours. Low risk contact is who shared the same space, for example, same class for the school, worked in the same room or similar, and not having a high risk exposure of the confirmed case of COVID-19, or who traveled in the same environment like bus, train, flight, any other mode of transit, but not having a high risk exposure. Death reporting is another aspect of transmission of information related to COVID. For reporting death, medical certificate of cause of death should be filled. All deaths should be investigated thoroughly for cause of death. All deaths should be reported to state authorities on daily basis. It is a typical medical certificate of cause of death containing part one, that is immediate cause and antecedent cause, and part two, that is other significant condition. Part one contain A, B, and C, and it should be filled as logical sequence from C to A. Means C leading to B and B leading to A. A is the final immediate cause, and it note the mode of the death. Right column have time period between onset and death for a particular cause. These are actually ten codes provided by WHO for COVID. U07.1 is for confirmed COVID-19. U072 is for probable and suspected COVID-19. A death due to COVID-19 may not be attributed to another cause like cancer, except an obvious cause like trauma. <laughs> As pre-existing conditions are likely to cause severe cause of COVID-19. COVID-19 should be recorded on medical certificate as cause of death for all diseased persons, whether it has caused or it is assumed to have caused or contributed to death. Now we will discuss some examples. How to report COVID deaths as per this MCCD format. First example is of 40 years old male diagnosed with COVID-19. Here COVID-19 will be at C. It leads to the B, that is pneumonia, and it leads to A, that is ARDS. That was immediate cause of death. Code is written as U07.1 and duration is mentioned about 7, 3, and 2 days. This example is about 60 years male, father of COVID-19 patients. He was diabetic, presented with ILI, and died. The COVID test was not available. Yes, he is the COVID-19 suspect with code U07.2. It leads to B, that is ILI, and B leads to A, that is ARDS. That was immediate cause. Diabetes will be in the part two, that is other significant condition. Here is a one more example. 50 years female who received chemo for breast cancer, admitted with breathlessness and developed shock and died. COVID was positive. Here C, B, A, R, COVID-19, pneumonia and DIC respectively. Breast cancer will be under part two, that is other significant condition. Data are used to know the incidence of the disease in various localities, age group affected, risk factors for severe disease and death. Based on disease incidence and prevalence, areas can be divided into different categories and area-specific preventive measures can be implemented. For example, in India, districts are divided into containment, red, orange and green zone and only essential activities are allowed in containment zones. To summarize, transmission of correct and complete information is an important step in managing an epidemic. We should follow country-specific guidelines for reporting disease and deaths. The available information should be used for further prevention and therapeutic options. Thank you.
Okay, so now uh, we come to the end of uh, today's session uh, and we have a few questions. Some have been answered on the WhatsApp uh, individual uh, uh, messages. Uh, I'll ask uh, the first uh, question to Dr. Arti uh, This is about the diagnostic strategy. So can RT-PCR be false positive? Uh, RT-PCR in a closed system, the assays that are currently available, they, uh, there is no theoretical possibility of a false positive. Uh, they use uh, specific primers and probes and they are all, uh, they are totally closed system, so no chance of any cross contamination. However, one has to be careful if you develop your in-house assays. And if at all, even then, um, because the advantage of a real-time PCR or a qPCR is that the CT values take care of the little contamination and so you use your cutoffs carefully and you need to have a look at the each and every positive sample when you are reporting with the in-house assays. So therefore, I don't think you can at present depend on this. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, so another question is about uh, any other diagnostic test with which we can confirm uh, COVID-19. So again, uh, some sometimes there's a confusion. The CBNAT, the gene expert based assays, the true NAT, that is also a real-time PCR platform. So only the advantage of, um, the disadvantage is the low numbers of tests that you can put at a given time, otherwise it has an advantage of being much more rapid. So that is also real-time PCR. And third is the antigen detection test, as you all know. That is, uh, again, the advantage is the rapidity and very high specificity. But the problem is the sensitivity, especially in an asymptomatic person. Therefore, you can use antigen detection in the symptomatic patients for a rapid screening in your emergencies. Uh, Ma'am, at this time point, do we have any blood tests with which we can confirm an acute infection? Yeah, so that is what we still need more data and we do not have uh, validated assays. As of now, whatever serology is being done is suitable for seroepidemiology. So we still do not have IgM-based uh, ELISAs or antibody testing assays. So I think we still have to work and wait for that time. Right, ma'am. So now we have uh, another set of questions regarding the goggles. So uh, there are these small rubber vents or there are rubber stoppers uh, or plastic stoppers which may be seen on the top surface or the side surface of the goggles that we use in the PPE. Uh, the function of these are these are like one way kind of valves and which would allow some amount of vapor and other things which may come in from evaporation of sweat while goggles are worn for a period of time to move out at the same time the one way thing prevents any extraneous fluid contamination getting into the area covered by the goggles so if the rubber stoppers have fallen by then this particular piece should not be used and should be replaced with a fresh one uh, another question is related to, uh, you know, whether the face shield is a substitute for goggles or should we just add to, in use it in addition to goggles for additional protection. So one thing which we need to remember is that using a face shield, we need to have one which is going to provide us adequate protection. Uh, the forehead part and all should be well covered, which would prevent any splashes or other things to get to the face area. The coverage of the uh, the uh, transparent sheet in front has to be adequate so as to provide, prevent any contamination happening from the sides, as well as its length should be adequate covering the, the mask area so that again chances of any contamination or exposure are uh, minimal. Uh, 
Now the agencies, different agencies kind of suggest we could use either goggles or face shield, but in certain high risk, uh, let's say procedures where there's a, there may be aerosol generation, uh, uh, there are times when the, the healthcare personnel are more comfortable using both goggles and uh, a face shield for added protection. But uh, in your usual setting, one could use uh, either of the two, that would be fine. Uh, only thing we need to make sure we're using the appropriate goggles and we're using appropriate type of face shield to provide uh, adequate uh, protection. So I think uh, we had a few questions related to the diagnostic management, which have been addressed to on the WhatsApp uh, personal messages itself. And uh, as we don't have any further questions, uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Cabra for his closing remarks. So friends, uh, this comes to an end of a series of webinars. These are 16 in number. We try to cover all the aspects related to COVID infection in children. And all of these were uh, webcast in four sessions. The first one was on 15th, second on 22nd, third on 29th and fourth is today. All these 16 are available as of now on uh, AIMS Telemedicine uh, channel, YouTube channel, and you can have access, unrestricted access to all these webinars. And as the scenario is changing very fast, we are learning more and more about the COVID behavior, COVID infection, and also management. So we are planning that after two to three weeks, we'll have a, another webinar to update what new has come in the science of uh, understanding uh, webin uh, COVID infection in children. You are most welcome to put your comments, questions in the uh, YouTube uh, chat box and we'll try our best to answer it in 24 to 48 hours. And uh, thank you very much. Right, okay. So I think we would close the session. Thank you.